Daniel chapter 3. That's where we're at. Let's once more just pause and ask for the Lord's help as we approach His Word. Father, this is Your Word. This is Your truth. This is Your way of communicating with us. So we come and we want to ask, would you speak to us through your word that we, your sheep, would hear the voice of our shepherd, that you would be at work in us. Your word is living and powerful and active and transformational. Would you do a work in us, grow us, Grow us to be more like Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar, in response to his dream that in chapter 2 that he was the head of gold, which would be then succeeded by lesser empires ultimately ultimately replaced by the kingdom crushing stone Nebuchadnezzar makes here in chapter 3 an image all of gold head to foot 90 feet high and demands that all peoples all nations all languages bow down fall down and worship the image that he has made God we learned through the voice of Daniel in chapter 2, God had given into King Nebuchadnezzar's hand authority over the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens. But Nebuchadnezzar, in response, did not give glory to God. Rather, he attempted to make a name for himself. Read with me Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whosoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Judging from the parallel event in chapter 6, Daniel and the lion's den, it's possible this event was politically motivated, possibly orchestrated, at least encouraged by the Chaldeans out of jealousy of the king's appointment of Jews to positions of authority over them. See, the king at the end of chapter 2 had promoted Daniel and his three friends to positions of authority over the Chaldeans. Verse 8. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. 
They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The Chaldeans here remind the king of his decree and of the consequences that he established for disobedience to his decree. Now they bring to the king's attention that there are three Jews whom he had appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon who stand in defiance of the king's orders. After Daniel's revealing of the king's dream and its interpretation, at the end of chapter 2 we read, Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Daniel remained at the king's court. This is likely meant to answer the question, where is Daniel in chapter 3? Daniel remained at the king's court with the king and all his governing officials gathered on the plain of Dura, several miles south of Babylon. Someone would need to remain behind in Babylon to maintain order in the city in the absence of the king and of the officials. There was obvious resentment on the part of the Chaldeans toward these foreigners, these exiles, these captives who had been elevated above them to positions of authority. They maliciously accused the Jews. That The word there is actually they ate the pieces of them. They ate the pieces of them. They... They wanted to devour them. They wanted to consume them. They had deep animosity and hatred toward them. And their animosity was thinly veiled. They wanted to see them destroyed. They even implicate the king in unwise decision making. Appointing foreigners to positions of power. Who are secretly rebels against the throne. Who will not bow. Who will not obey. They said, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. It's personal. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Their accusation is partly true. Indeed, they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you, O king, have set up. That was not a gray area. That was not something, it's like, well, it's a matter of conscience and, you know, some Jews feel safe to bow to this image in worship and and others, their conscience would bother them, so they they refrain. This is not a gray area. This is not a, Exodus chapter 20 is clear. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for Yahweh your God is a jealous God. Their conscience, the conscience of these three was captive to the word of God. So they could not bow to the image, or serve the gods of Babylon. But the allegation that they pay no attention to you, O king, that was false. They were summoned, along with the other list of leadership in the country, they were summoned to assemble at the plain of Dura, and and they were there. They had come. 
in obedience to the king's decree. Uh, there's, there's no evidence that they acted with anything short of the greatest integrity in their positions of authority over the province of Babylon. In fact, if they had performed poorly in those duties, if they had shirked their responsibility to govern rightly, if they had undermined the authority of the king in any way, the Chaldeans surely would have brought it to the king's attention. You see, these three were following the instruction of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. God is saying, I sent you, you're my missionaries. I sent you into exile. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 7, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Seek the good of the city. Seek to be a blessing to the city in which you are exiled. And I think it's clear from the context of this passage that Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were, they had a great work ethic. They were doing all that they could do to be a blessing to the city. Those who know and follow Jesus should have the greatest integrity. The best, they should be the best employees. They should have the highest work ethic because we know that we are not just working for an earthly master, for an earthly paycheck. We are serving the Lord Christ. Not to raise the bar for all of us. Our employers should be surprised at how diligent, how disciplined, how much integrity followers of Jesus have in their employment. Paul says to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 3, verse 22. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, not just when the boss is looking, not just when it's time when you're up for review, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, even when no one's looking. Even when no one knows, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever, is, is that comprehensive enough? Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That's New Testament. We're in the Old Testament. But I believe Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah understood this concept. We are here to seek the good of the city. Not only to bless the people around us. But ultimately an act of worship to the Lord. We are going to serve as officials in the province of Babylon in such a way that God is glorified. Now we're not told how these three Hebrews refused to bow. There is no evidence that they petitioned the king for an exemption to his decree. We're going to write a letter and say, you know, conscientious objectors, I mean, can we be excused? There's no evidence... Uh, there, there's no evidence, it doesn't say that they drew attention to themselves in their refusal to worship. Uh, there's nothing that says they attempted to persuade others to join them in their stand, in their refusal to bow. Carrying signs, waving banners, shouting the danger of bowing to false gods. It seems that when the music played and all the peoples, the nations, the languages fell down and worshipped the Im image... They simply and quietly stood their ground. 
their conscience captive to the Word of God. Didn't make a big deal about it. But the Chaldeans made a big deal about it. They brought them before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar was foolishly persuaded by the flattery of the Chaldeans. He allowed his raging pride to overshadow clear-headed judgment. And he took offense against these three Jews. It says in verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage, he wasn't just furious, he wasn't just in a rage, he was in a furious rage. You ever experienced that? He was in a furious rage. Commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, but if you do not worship you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? The king, in raging pride, asks if it's true that they do not serve his gods or worship the image he has set up. But he doesn't give them time to respond to that question. He starts by saying he's going to give them another chance to worship the image, but he doesn't even finish his sentence. He interrupts himself to remind them of the punishment for those who refuse to worship. Now, it's likely that this furnace had been used to refine and melt the gold that was used for the construction of this colossal image on the plain of Dura. It was already there. It was used for the construction of the image. It's possible that archaeologists have found a a place south of Babylon that has a brick structure that may have served as the pedestal for this image. We don't know, uh, but it's it's a plausible explanation. Uh, Mesopotamian smelting furnaces has a large opening at the top to add the ore to be refined. A smaller opening at ground level for feeding the fire with wood with charcoal. It was kept burning... During this event as a visual reminder of the consequence for failure to worship. Failure to obey the king. This is what happens to those who disobey the king. You see, remember, Nebuchadnezzar is seeking to solidify his control. To to make sure his empire lasts. To weed out any rebels. And King Nebuchadnezzar makes this arrogant and blasphemous statement. Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? He learned in chapter 2 that there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, who is all-knowing and wise, but he has yet to learn that this God is also all-powerful and sovereign. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was the God maker. He set up this image for all peoples, all nations, all languages to worship. If he could set up the image, that meant that he was in control. He was more powerful even than the God behind this image that he, Nebuchadnezzar, had set up. It was into his hands that God had given dominion. And it was out of his hands that those who opposed him would need to be rescued. See, Nebuchadnezzar knew the authority, the power that he possessed. The Chaldeans had accused. The Jews had been apprehended. They were standing before the king. The furnace was blazing. And there was no way on earth for these three to escape from these two alternatives. Either bow in worship or be burned in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar was in absolute control and he knew it. Even God can't rescue you now out of my hands. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... 
answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. No negotiation. No begging for mercy. No discussion. No need to give reason to argue in their own defense. No need for the orchestra to play the symphony again. They were resolute and they were willing to suffer the consequences of their stand. Their conscience was captive to the word of God, to a higher authority. They were glad to serve the king, glad to seek the good of the city, but they would not serve the gods of the king. And they would not worship the image that he had set up. You see, compromise would not be seeking the good of the city. God had sent them on a mission into exile, into Babylon, so that the nations would know that there is a God in heaven. They were on mission. They were willing to submit to the king's God-given authority, but they would not compromise their testimony before the living God by acknowledging false gods. So, Yahweh is gracious. Who is what God is? And Yahweh will help. That's, that's what their Hebrew names mean. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. They testify to the God they serve. God is able I want to read a, a verse from Luke uh, chapter 21, if I can. Jesus said, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogue and prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand on how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. Some of you will be put to death. God is able, they said, to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. God who created all that exists by his word. God who destroyed all life on earth with a flood. God who rescued his people from bondage in Egypt with displays of his mighty sovereignty over the false gods of Egypt. God who took his people safely through the midst of the Red Sea and then closed that sea over the heads of their enemies. God who brought down the walls of Jericho. God who sent an angel to kill 185,000 Assyrians who had besieged Jerusalem in response to Hezekiah's prayer. God who had given these four Hebrews favor with the chief of the eunuchs and prospered them in exile in Babylon. God who answered their prayers and revealed to them the king's dream. This God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Our God is able. There is no limit to His power. His hand, Isaiah 50, is not shortened that He cannot save. Nothing, Jeremiah 32, is too difficult, too hard for the Lord. There is no king too powerful. There is no furnace too hot. There is no cancer too advanced. There is no prodigal too far gone. 
Jesus spoke into the tomb of his friend who had been dead for four days. And Lazarus came out. Our God is mighty to save. Nothing, Luke 1, nothing is impossible with God. God can deliver out His people out from the burning, fiery furnace. God can deliver His people out of the hand of the most powerful king. These three had no doubt about the ability of their God to do whatever He pleases. God does all that He pleases. The next three words are stunning. But if not, there's no question about God's power, God's ability. But there was a realistic realization that although God can save, sometimes he does not save. And this is not lack either of power or goodness on God's part. God saved Jerusalem from the Assyrians in response to Hezekiah's prayer. God gave Jerusalem into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in Daniel chapter 1. God could have saved Joseph from his brothers who conspired against him and sold him into slavery. But instead, God sent Joseph ahead into slavery in order to preserve life for many people, we're told in Genesis 45 and Genesis 50. God did it by sending him to prison, by having him sold as a slave. Could have rescued him out of the hands of his brothers. If not, we know God is able to save, but what if he doesn't rescue in the way that I want him to rescue right now? So many of us love salvation by grace. God freely gives good to those who do not deserve it. But friends, we don't, we don't like to live by grace. We, we want to live by works. When bad things happen to us, we begin to say, what, what did I do wrong? To deserve this. If we want to live by works, the answer is, I'm a sinner. What I deserve is hell. What I deserve is the almighty wrath of God for eternity toward me, a sinner. That's what, that's what I deserve. But to those who live by grace, we enjoy a gift we didn't earn and don't deserve. A gift God is free, not obligated, free to give. But somehow that works mentality is so ingrained in us, it sneaks back in and we switch over to our default thinking that, well, if I do the right thing, God is obligated, not free, no longer free. He's not obligated to me to do good to me right now. He's obligated to reward my good behavior with the blessings that I think I need. We so easily forget that any good that we do is not I, but the grace of God that is with me. See, we want to come to Jesus on our terms, not His. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life to all who believe in Him. Great, I'll take that. Reconciliation with God, an all-satisfying relationship with the God of the universe, the creator of all things. Sounds good to me. Fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore at His right hand. Sign me up. Take up your cross and follow me. In the world, you will have tribulation. Wait, I, I, can I pass on those? <laughs> God hears and answers prayers. That's great. Sometimes He says no. I'd rather have a genie in a bottle. <laughs> you see, these three give us a beautiful example of bold confidence in the omnipotence of God and humble submission to the sovereign wisdom of God. God is able to save. 
But if he doesn't save right here, right now, will I walk away? If God doesn't answer my prayers in the way I think he ought to, am I done with him? Will I doubt his goodness? Question his love? But if not, we have to answer that question for ourselves. What if things don't go the way we pray, the way we hope? But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. When Jesus said some things in John 6 that were hard to swallow, many stopped following him and walked away. That happens. That happens today. When he turned and asked his disciples if they too were going to go away, Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What you said is really difficult. I'm choking on it. I'm struggling. I, I don't know. But, but you know what? You're my only hope. There's no other place to go. There's no other place to turn. If you really are who you say you are, if you are God in the flesh, come down to save us from our sins, then whatever you say, I've got to swallow. Job, in the midst of his anguish, said, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Chapter 19, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will stand upon the earth. And after, listen, after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for, my, uh, for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. My heart faints within me. Even if my skin and my flesh is destroyed. The author of Hebrews celebrates the faith of those who through faith conquered kingdoms. Enforced justice. Obtained promises. Stopped the mouths of lions. Quenched the power of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Stop the mouths of lions, quench the power of the fire. These are exciting stories of miraculous deliverance. But Hebrews saves the best till last. Hebrews 11.35, some were tortured, refusing to accept release. So that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging. And even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats. Destitute, afflicted, mistreated. Of whom the world was not worthy. Paul said in Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. See, these are the heroes of the faith. Some are rescued miraculously. God is able. But if not, but if not, you have to answer that question. But if not, may He find us faithful. Even unto death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, renew our confidence in you as our King and our God. Give us a fresh vision of your absolute omnipotence, that nothing is too hard for you. Also give us childlike trust in your wisdom and sovereignty that you will do what is best. And that may not always be what we prefer or what we ask for. Give us the humble 
trust. To say, not my will, but yours be done. And give us the courageous, tenacious faith to stand in the face of adversity. To have our consciences bound by your word. To say, we will not bow down to false gods. You have sent us on mission here in this place. Give us wisdom. Give us opportunity to put your name, your character on display before all peoples, nations, and languages. Because you, Jesus, are pursuing the nations through us. So Lord, give us the right words to say. Help us to know the things we need to take a stand on. Lord, I pray that you would draw many by our witness, by our testimony into a relationship with you for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite some of the men to come up. We are going to celebrate what Jesus did for us. We're going to take bread and juice, communion, uh, a reminder of what he paid, the price that was paid to rescue sinners like him, to bring us into a relationship with him that, that now he is my greatest treasure. My life is not my greatest treasure. Self-preservation is not what it's all about. I was created to bring glory to him, whether by life or by death. To live as Christ, I hope that's our heart, our attitude, that when we go back to work tomorrow, to live as Christ. That we're putting Him on display by our work ethic, by our integrity, by our character, by the stands that we take. To live as Christ, to die, huh, that's gain. That's gain. I get to go to be with Him. So if you take my life, if you... Take away all that is precious to me. You can't take away Jesus. <clears throat> Do we consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing to the glory that is to re be revealed to us? Do we consider the treasures of a relationship with Jesus greater treasure than anything this earth can? This is a reminder of what really matters. Bread and juice, Jesus' broken body and shed blood. A picture of his love for sinners like me. And a reminder of that which truly feeds our soul, that which truly satisfies. It's not the things of this earth. May the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for becoming human. To take my place on the cross. To die the death I deserve. So that I could enjoy a relationship with you. Forgiven, accepted, loved, welcomed. At your table. Lord, if you take... These simple reminders draw our hearts to you, draw our hearts to worship, to treasure that which is most valuable, to remember, to worship you because you're worthy. In Jesus' name. Jesus, we are not our own. We were bought with a price. <coughs> we were created to bring glory and honor to you. So, Lord, you, we come to you today and recognize you 
are the Lord Christ whom we serve today, tomorrow, throughout the week. That you're our King. To you alone do we bow the knee. You are our God. Thank you for pursuing us, for purchasing us with your own blood. And may we live today and every day, every moment, for your glory. To serve not others, but you. Fill us with your spirit. Enable us, by your grace, to live lives that bring glory and honor to you, because you're worthy. We remember what you did and whose we are. And we say thank you. His body broken for you. Take it in. His blood poured out for you. Drink.